Good morning and welcome to To The Point. It is Monday, June 21st, 2021. Thank you to those of you joining us on the GBN Grenada Broadcasting Network's Facebook page, the Grenada Broadcasting Network's YouTube channel, the website www.gbn.gd, GBN TV, channel 7, 11 and 20. Good morning to the listeners of Classic 105.5, 105.9 and the folks joining us on Party Grenada and Go To Fet Facebook pages. Thank you so very much for joining us. My virtual guest this morning is the Public Relations Officer of the Public Workers Union, Ms. Daisy Hazard, and she's here to give us, of course, some of the latest as the PWU continues this industrial fight and uh, representing the largest set of workers, the public, no, is the largest union representing workers, representing public officers. Good morning, Ms. Hazard, and thank you once again for joining us. Good morning. Good morning, Blossom, listeners and viewers all across Grenada, Caracol, Piti Martinique, and indeed the diaspora. And I do want to say um, happy Father's Day belated to all our fathers out there. Hope that the mothers and the children made it wonderful for you. And those fathers who have been missing in action and absent, you still do have the time to pull your socks up. Amen. Well said. Um, on behalf of fathers, thank you for the greetings. <laughs> You're so welcome, mother. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Ms. Hazard, let's get into it. This morning, we're going to start from, well, I know the uh, the union is expected to meet with, I believe, is the Minister of Labor, Honorable yes. Peter David, tomorrow, God willing. Um, but before we get into your expectations, I'm going to start with a statement made by Prime Minister Dr. Keith Mitchell, uh, not last week, I believe it was a week before, um, during a uh, press engagement. Um, and he said that uh, it doesn't seem like public officers want the 4% salary increase. It seems like PWU and its uh, its workers all ain't want the money because y'all are not protesting as hard as the GUT. Did you hear him make that statement? What did you think about it, if you heard it? Um, um, Blossom, you know, I, I tend in my representation of the workers of this country to not specify or single out any parliamentarian or member of government at all um, for this course. Um, as, as a union, we tend to like to speak about the administration. But in recent weeks, it has been very, very unfortunate that um, public policy seems to have taken, it seems to be dispensed in street fighting. I, I think the public would have heard um, the prime minister recently in speaking about making a very derogatory statement, an unfortunate and discriminative statement, discriminatory statement about a gentleman um, indicate that if he was in the street, what he would have said would have been different. And um, it seems indeed that when, when the prime minister reaches into the street, um, sometimes he tends to forget that he is the prime minister of his country because in regardless to where you are, whether you are in the parliament, you are in the public domain anywhere, the role of prime minister, the role of a government minister, the role of being um, the government of the day, that cannot be dispensed with, unfortunately. So your public persona is really tied up um, irrevocably and inextricably with your, your, your private persona. But um, to speak directly to those comments, it is unfortunate that um, the government, this administration has to admit through its prime minister that our democracy is challenged and our democracy is at risk. And where workers have a grievance that should be ironed out very professionally and um, with, with, with a view to engaging in the least possible conflict for the good of our society, for the good of social peace and the social construct, that government would indicate and government would proud, proudly and boldly declare that unless there is fighting, that unless persons engage in, 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 in fighting on the street in protest action, um, they cannot get justice in this country. And that is unfortunate. Um, and for the government to make that declaration, and, and even further, I think this weekend they were politicking in Karakou. And um, it was unfortunate to hear another government minister allude to the fact that they have a 14-seat majority. And therefore, it was out of place and seemed so contrary for anybody to want to protest about anything at all. And those, green, those of us who have been listening and those of you who did not listen, take a listen, because it is frightening to hear a minister of government um, making those claims. Because what you are saying is that because you sit in our democratic parliament and there is nobody on the opposition side per se, that somehow you are you now above the, the, the dictates of law, that the, ru the rules of law of our country does not apply to you. And that is frightening. And so... Um, as we go to meet with the Labour Commissioner tomorrow, 
Um, we know that government has been meeting with the GOT. Um, we know that government has had several meetings with the GOT and um, other public sector um, organizations somehow um, have sort of been lagging behind. Um, but what we want to say to the government and to the public is that, you know, recently, again, the government alluded that they're so proud of teachers. You know, they love teachers. They love the children of this country. And they woke up one morning and, and they had a vision where they finally remembered that where they are today, the roles that they carry out today, the education that they've been able to attain, the doctoral degrees and so forth and so on, that that was because of teachers. And you, and you wonder, where was the government before? Were they sleeping? Were they in a slumber? Were they in a deep dream? Because for the last number of years, they have been engaging in open brawling and street fighting with the teachers of this country and public servants. And so when you come now to tell us that, you know, it's nothing to do with politics, we just love the children and we care so deeply about teachers because we know that we are who we are today um, because of our teachers. The question is, when did, you, when, you, when did you get that knowledge? Where was it before? Where was that conscience? Where was that duty of care before? And um, to sort of intimate that somehow government can go ahead and pay teachers the 4% that is due to them but other public officers would not be so fortunate or lucky to receive their 4% money that has been due since January. It's insulting. And, and I, think, I think the public is owed an apology on nurses or doctors or engineers or lawyers all throughout this country that, are, that is giving service every day. We are owed an apology and we want to say to the government, you are not the only ones who benefited from um, having a psychology teacher in school. The little games that you're trying to play where you pit one union against the other, that is not going to work because we are all speaking to each other. When you meet with the duty, we are aware of it. The, the contents of your discourse and the decisions that you come to, all public sector unions are aware of it because we stand in solidarity. We stand together with each other. And so tomorrow, when we meet with the Labour Commissioner, we don't expect a lot of pussyfooting around. We don't expect that anybody would call us there to waste our time. We have work to do on behalf of this public. And we expect that whatever offer is presently before the GUT, that offer would also be placed before us. Because all public servants are equal in this country. There is none more equal than the other. I'm glad you um, said that because that was going to be my next question because I saw the news release issued by the GUT last week that they um, they agree that teachers would receive their 4% or they would see it reflected in their pay from the end of August. Um, and it, it dawned on me that that's specifically about teachers. So it seems like there's this, what I call disparity with the agreements between government and teachers or the teachers union and government and PWU. How, how is that working out? Is it, is it that uh, the teachers would get in August and the P public office officers have to wait until maybe December, like initially stated? How, how does that work? Or is it one collective right. thing? So you've asked about three questions. Let me see if I can answer all. All right. One. Um, as of now, we do not have an offer from the government, um, save and accept that they had offered to pay this money in December of 2021, retroactively. And um, the last conversation that we had before the Labor Commissioner indicated that during or towards the end of June, government would review its fiscal position and would give us a definitive date as to when that money can be paid. Um, so we are going to have discussions with the Labor Commissioner tomorrow, and we expect to be presented with a fiscal review, as promised, at the table. And we are going to look at what government presents to us in that fiscal review, facts and figures, and we will entertain discussion on that basis. Um, in terms of can the government go ahead with a... a and pay another um, group of, of public sector workers and not pay another group. Um, that should not happen. It cannot happen. Now, we have seen our government operate in, very, in, in, in a rogue fashion in the past and done things out of principle and out of law. But again, we do not expect that to happen because, you see, unions can, public sector unions are sovereign unions. You have GOT, TAWU, Public Workers Union, um, prisons have their association, policemen also have their association. And I always like to remind the public that public servants are not just teachers and public servants are not those workers who are represented by the Grenada Public Workers Union. They are policemen, they are prisons officers. So it's a lot of workers. You're not just talking about one group of workers. You are talking about the people who keep this country safe, 
which who keeps this country running on a day-to-day -day basis. We can get rid of the 14 persons who sit in parliament today. And the systems that, that, that govern our country, the way it should function, once our public sector works, once our public officers work, our country would continue to run. You cannot get rid of public servants. You cannot take all public servants and send them at home en masse today because then your, your, your society would grind to a halt. Your society would devolve into chaos. And so let's make that clear. The persons in this society who are important it's not the 14 persons who are bragging that they're sitting in parliament and so therefore no one should contradict them. They are important and they have their role to play, but public servants also have their role to play as well. And so all of these unions will go and will we'll, we'll, we'll bargain separately. In the case of GUT, um, sorry, GPWU, my union and the TAU, we have over the past couple of years bargained as one unit, two unions together, which is why we are called the joint unions. But what happens at the end of the day? Once a period, a period of negotiations is over, whatever is the best deal or best package of benefits in terms of salary increases that is worked out by any public sector, sector union, all unions receive it. So th there has been instances in the past. There was an instance in the past where we had to receive a one-off payment. And the GOT would have agreed, I think, for it was a sum of $700 at the table and signed for that. And then the PWU also went to negotiate that settlement and we signed for $1,500. And all public sector workers, all policemen, teachers, um, GPWU, we receive $1,500 because that is the agreement. Once the wash is over, once all unions are, are finished negotiating, whichever is the best package of, of benefits or settlement that one particular public sector union has um, agreed on, all unions benefit from it. Because no union or no worker must come out ahead of another worker because we are all public sector workers. So when we see the government, the administration and prime minister out there saying these things, we know that that's appealing, um, not to logic and to reason, but perhaps to voters. Okay, well, thanks for that explanation. Yes. So that leaves the question, why not just do one meeting and done? Um, you see, I think, Blossom, you know, things are dynamic and things change. Um, and so you have unions, when, 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 when unions go to negotiate, you know, you meet with your specific, because every single the thing that we do workers when the GOT has to make an agreement with government when government offered them bonds for instance the executive had to go back to their workers their teachers to say do you agree to this when we meet with the labor commissioner tomorrow whatever is the outcome of that meeting we have to we have to circularize and notarize our members we also have to go back to them if we intend to make a decision and so it is easier for unions sovereign unions to manage their business with their group of workers individually in the case of Tau, Tau, the, the, the workers who are covered under Tau and are public workers, those numbers are small. And so it makes sense. And because they also work in the physical plant with uh, our workers, PW workers, it makes sense to negotiate together. Teachers work in another set of plants, in another physical set of physical plants. And so, you know, the sovereignty and being able to negotiate separately, that makes logical sense. But as to whether we are all under one umbrella body, the TUC, and as to whether we speak with each other and we dialogue and we share and we, and we discuss strategy and we discuss next steps and we discuss with each other, what is the government saying? What have they said to you? We do that as a matter of form. And so no one should take, no one should be of the view that somehow you're using one union to outsmart the other, or you're using one union to gain a psychological advantage over the other. We are aware of you, we are onto you. We know what you're trying to do. Um, the principle of divide and conquer, divide and rule is one that, you know, if you look historically, it's a pattern that this government has used. Um, but we have also benefited from teachers, as, as I've said before. We know the little games and the little tricks, and we are on to government. We wouldn't be fooled by that, and unions would not be caught in a situation where um, one union is satisfied or not satisfied or dissatisfied. And so then we turn from what has proven to be a common enemy and, and start fighting with each other. That is certainly not going to happen. So as you head into the meeting tomorrow, please, Lord, with Minister David, um, and, and I'll use your phrase here, you don't expect there to be pussyfooting around. Uh, what, are your expect how the, what are your expectations for the outcome? And if it is not to your liking, expectations, desire, what steps are the PW prepared to face or to take fighting for that 4%? 
um, Blossom, you do stay on task because the media asks us that question all the time. And so let's try to answer it. Again, as I've said, we expect tomorrow to be presented with some facts and, and figures, hard facts and figures. Now, we have seen in the past when we sit with government and they promise us hard facts and figures, somehow when we, whenever we go back to them, um, we never get that. But we expect to get that tomorrow because government has been saying to this public from, from since January that we do not have the means to pay, we cannot pay. Um, or fiscal, um, the revenue does not allow it. And so if you're going to come to say you want to pay before December and you want to pay sooner, um, definitely there must be a justi justification in the figures to show that. We want a solution um, from our unions in. We want, what workers want is their 4%. If you notice I'm blossom in the last probably three weeks or so, every single week, gasoline prices and fuel prices has gone up in this country. When you go to the supermarkets, if you don't have a good heart, you are going to faint. Um, some people tell you that they have cut down and reduced on the, on the amount of times that they go to the supermarket, not because they don't need goods, but because each time you have to go to the supermarket, you have to brace yourself. You have to take a, a high blood pressure pill or an, an anti-anxiety tablet. You have to take something to prepare you for picking up the few little items that you put into your basket and you get to the cash and they tell you three, four hundred dollars. And that's just for basic necessities. When you think about trying to buy fruits and vegetables, commodities that should be basic, at basic, basic prices in our country, um, you can't buy it. When you think about the taxes, when you think about the things that have been, even in this COVID period, that government has just quietly and unceremoniously offered, ushered onto the public. We pay these taxes that have been increased, court fees, so many other things. Um, we need our 4%. And so we want to settle this issue. The 4% matter is a bit of an irritant. It is really irritating to have to be dealing with it still because there are so many things that we need to be focused on. And I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. While government has been distracting unions with the 4%, they have been wreaking havoc in the public service and with young Grenadian lives in the unconscionable ways that they have been hiring and firing persons. And I want to stick that point, Blossom, and come to it later because I want to elaborate a bit more on it. So just to say, Blossom, that um, we will take action. We will take action. Um, and our, our members are not without, we, we are not without recourse. I've also heard, we have also heard the administration making, saying that, um, you know, for some reason, public workers are not coming out. It's not because um, public workers are fully in support of the union. When I walk through ministries and so workers say to me, it's hazard, we are proud of the job that you all are doing. We want our monies, don't give up. But they also tell you, I'm afraid because I'm a contract worker. I've been on contract for 10 years. I've been on contract for 12 years. My salary is $1,200. We've had so many reports of workers saying to us that I've been called into an office and forced to sign a contract, which is new and totally different to the one that I've had for 10 years. I've been forced to give up the 10 years of service that I've given, unestablished albeit, but now I've been forced to sign a contract as if I've just started working with government. There are persons who have been acting as if we are actors in Hollywood for years. And those persons are saying to you, I'm afraid because I'm threatened. When the union say to wear red, um, I have to wear red in my bag or in my pocket because if I even wear a red shoe, somebody calls me up and reprimands me. If I post something in social media to say I want my 4%, somebody calls me up to reprimand me. So what we're seeing here is that we have a government that is ruling by faith. And our public servant workers who are in the ministries and government departments where they interact with ministers and supervisors on a daily basis, yes, they do admit to that faith. They do admit that the conditions of the employment seem to be governed primarily by faith. Now, we are talking about a country that is democratic. We are talking about a country that has a 1974 constitution. Um, did I say that the year, um, if I'm not correct with the year, please forgive me. We are talking about a country that has a lab, that has a labor, a labor laws. This is a labor code of Grenada, which governs and sets out how persons are to be employed. And yet you are, you have people telling you, I feel like a slave. I have been employed by like a slave where persons can push me around, where my salary does not increase year after year. And so when you ask me to wear my union t-shirt, sometimes I wear it, but I'm afraid. We had some mental health workers who are working under severe duress come into the union hall last week. And some of them are saying, when I wear my union t-shirt, I wear it, but I'm wondering what's next. Who's going to call me in and call me up on the carpet just because I wore my union t-shirt? And so 
Our workers stand firmly behind the union. We are not re without recourse. And, and Blossom, when you push your people beyond their limits, when you push your people beyond the terms, the, 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 the extent of the endurance, when people cannot take more, the backlash and what happens is usually very detrimental. And I would want to urge this administration, because you have called the public service so much in the in the nefarious ways and illegal and unlawful ways that you have been employing people because you have called them so much and somehow you feel that they will not stand up for their own rights in this democratic society. I want to warn, I want to urge us to take heed and take caution that you do not push our people to the extent that they cannot take any more. Our nurses and doctors who are still standing in, in the fight, in the breach against COVID, the persons who go out every day and face incoming visitors to do their, their PCR testing are our nurses. Those are the persons who are standing at the front line still of our country. The police officers who have to intercept people who hitch a right and hide from St. Vincent and come back home because they're Grenadians. And since after the, 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 the volcano, life is too hard over there. So they hitch a ride, they bomb a ride, just as you would if you're coming down from St. David's or St. Patrick, hitch a boat here or there and end up in Grenada. They have to be quarantined. The policemen have to deal with them. The Coast Guard officers have to deal with them. Our public officers, officers have to deal with them. And these are the people who are standing in guard of our society every day. So when, the, when, when we hear our government speak about the pandemic and say that because of the pandemic, our revenues have dropped so much, and so we cannot pay these people. I mean, it was such an affront to hear from Karaku this weekend that, you know, we have to, people, to pay people who clean by the side of the road, and we have to build roads, and we have to repair roads, and so, so we cannot pay public servants 4%, and we don't understand the agitation. Are you kidding me? I mean, I, I can't find the words beyond saying that this is such an insult. The greatest resource of any country the greatest resource of any organization, if you speak to um, Bill Gates, if you speak to all these Fortune 500 companies, owners, managers, they will tell you that they invest not in plants necessarily only, but in their, phys in their human resource capital. Other governments in this region seem to understand the value of the human resource capital, but you have a government that consistently says to you, public servants don't matter. Who are these people? They are already getting enough. Enough of what? And so we have to secure persons who get seed. And we have to secure persons who do the day's work by the road. We know who those persons are. And we would want to suggest that perhaps the party should, should pay those persons, not the public purse. Just last year, was it two years ago? We had a senior manager in the public servant, an established worker, who cried out about the foul taking place in some of these aid programs. Names that are listed that should not be receiving any benefits because they're hard back, able-bodied men and women who can go out to work and who are working, but yet you see them in the lineup for, for seed money every month. That person, that person was sent on leave. Nobody said within the government, let me take that list and scrutinize it and clean it up because we cannot be paying persons who should not be paid. Yes, as a society, we have to take care of our poor and vulnerable. Yes, as a society, we have to take care of those persons who are in need, but we cannot take care of those persons and not take care of the persons who are going to be paying back the taxes that can still support those persons. So you cannot say to public officers, you don't deserve to be paid because there's COVID and other persons um, needs to be paid and roads need to be fixed. Roads cannot build your economy. We do need good roads. We demand good roads. We pay enough taxes to have good roads. The conditions of the roads in this country right now is deplorable. It should not be in that condition. But we have seen a government spending and spending as if it's the last day of the party. We have seen them spending as if there's too much food to eat. And so everybody has to be gotten us. Where is it? Where's the, where, where's the advisor that's just been hired by the government to advise the prime minister in action? And indeed, when we when we hear remarks that's being made from the from that good office in the street and in our parliament, we want to know what's the purpose of that advisor? Why were you hired? Because it seems since your advent. Since you have come in as, as an advisor and all those consultants that we pay ridiculous sums of money every month, even persons who are prior public servants, just a few years in the service, not 20 years and 30 something years like persons like me, six years, and then somehow we see that person ascend into a position of being a consultant, huh? a triple the amount of money that they were receiving as a public officer. You, you're spending those kinds of monies while you are there crying foul, crying shame on the public service, shame on you. It is shameful 
that this government has embroiled the public service in this much chaos and this country in this much chaos for the last number of months. Even if government had sat reasonably with public servants, with unions, and said, let's come to some good kind of a com compromise, that would have happened because we were willing to compromise. From the beginning, we compromised. And so, yes, Blossom, our workers do have recourse, our union do ha does have recourse, and should we need to go that further step, should we need to take our action and upscale it, we will do it. And we want to promise that even if it's five of us or 10 of us, we will do what we have to do. Because I'll tell you something, and Blossom, even if it's one person, when you stand for change, when you stand for something, you can carry a revolution. I firmly believe that, and our union believes that. Um, and before we go to the break, another uh, think topic that I wanted to ask about is in relation to the vaccination drive going on island-wide. Uh, it has been, in recent weeks, a lot of people feel like they've been pressured to get vaccinated when they don't want to. And last week, the issue really raised its head with the situation down at St. George's University and, some, and the unvaccinated workers barred from entering the premises. What are the PW's thoughts on the situation? Um, and I know Tao is a union representing the workers there, but still, what are the, the union's thoughts on the situation? How can you help? What advice do you have for these workers? Um, you know, um, one of the phrases that we like in our society right now is don't go there. And um, perhaps I might have wished that you didn't go there, but it, it is a topic. It is something that's swirling around our society, right? Be so. And um, we cannot shy away from it. We must talk about it. And I want to say that it is unfortunate that government has handled this part of the COVID debate in the manner that it has. And I stick that there blossom. So if I do not elaborate on it, you'll remind me so that I can. Let me make it clear to our listening public. I am not anti-vaccination, neither am I pro-vaccine. And I say this as Daisy Hazard, not as PWU. I'll also say that at our council level discussions at the PWU, we are not anti-vaccination, neither are we pro-vaccination. What we do know is that the world and our country is confronted with and has been confronted with the question of the COVID-19 virus, whatever it might be, um, for the past year and more. And we are told by the authorities, we are told by the scientists that we trust and believe in, that the way to get our societies back on foot um, is through vaccination. And so I believe the onus is on all of us as citizens, individual citizens, in, in, in our own private minds, to make a determination perhaps to go out there and be vaccinated. Now, would all of us just agree to rush down to the stadium or anywhere that there is a vaccination center and get vaccinated? No. And Blossom, if that happened, then we should be concerned as a society because um, we are the 110,000 of us here, as small as we may be, we don't have one single mind. And um, I see people getting a bit furious and, 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 uh, and you know, almost like a vaccine kind of a rabies kind of a thing um, at persons who are hesitant to take the vaccine. Um, and I don't know that we should feel that way. I, I do believe, as I've said before, yes, perhaps it's the best course to go because that's what the science tells us, that what, that's what our authorities tell us. And we see um, the number of persons who have died and we have told have died um, because of the COVID virus in the diaspora. We have never seen that level of death before. Um, we see right in neighboring Trinidad, um, persons are dying. Just last week, my, my extended family lost a young lady, a police officer. She died. Um, this is the second death that that family has had to confront in the diaspora from COVID. And so we, we, it's coming home to us. And the question is, are we going to wait until the COVID comes back to Grenada? Because right now we know for sure that there's no COVID, there's no COVID spreading in the society. Are we going to wait and then if the person starts to die or become infected or, or, or sick, um, to go get the COVID vaccine. So I think it's a question that we all have to ask ourselves. How do we protect our elders? How do we protect the persons who are not as healthy among us? Um, do we want to take that vaccine? But on the question of an employer being able to mandate and dictate to a worker that you should take um, the COVID vaccine, the jury is really out on that one. Um, there are several schools of thought. And um, there are some schools of thought that says, yes, that the individual right cannot trump the group right. 
that your right to not take the vaccine or take the vaccine cannot trump the greater good of the society. But at the same time, can the greater good of the society dictate to every single person that I should go out there and get vaccinated? If we also look at the science, and I'm no expert, the science also tells us that it is not good for the whole of a population to be vaccinated because then you lose herd immunity. Um, a number of things can happen. What you need is 70 to 80 percent of, of a population. And again, if the experts are out there and I'm, I'm incorrect, please forgive me. Um, and so, again, let's come back to the question of mandatory vaccination. As the TUC has said, as Brother Brian Grimes, my president, has said, and this is supported by the Industrial Court of Trinidad and Tobago um, in the form of the president, Deborah Thomas Felix. And I quote the Industrial Court in Grenada because unfortunately we do not have an Industrial Court in Grenada. So I'm quoting Trinidad. Um, no employer has the right to enforce an employee to take the COVID-19 vaccine. It, it, an employer cannot mandate it. This is industrial court in Trinidad speaking. And, and the premise on which the court, on which Ms. Thomas Felix has made that determination and that judgment is on the basis that workers have existing bargaining agreements. So you as a worker, I as a worker, every worker out there who's working with a company or who is employed somewhere, you already have existing terms and conditions of your employment. The COVID-19 vaccine is new. And so to therefore put that in there is to alter, to change that bargaining agreement. Now for incoming or new employees, a, an employer may put that in there. And it will be now up to the employee to say, I, the person, the prospective employee to say, okay, I can meet these sums and conditions. And so therefore I would, I would take up a job there if I'm given it. But for persons who are there presently, it is not advisable that an employer should try to mandate that. And again, if we look at our labor code, and despite the statements by employers, hmm, despite this, the contradictory statements by our government, and I say contradictory, the labor code speaks clearly. Now, we have heard the prime minister and cabinet say that they will not legislate COVID-19 vaccine, and rightly so. We have heard them say that they are not going to pass it into law, and rightly so. But what we've heard is that the minute you finish saying it in parliament, then you go on the street and you say, if I were an employer, I would do it. I would mandate it. And if I don't blame the employers. Now, what you have here, Blossom, is the head of our government making one statement officially. And then on the other hand, you are signaling to employers of the state, sorry, employers in our country, that it's okay for them to exercise carte blanche over their workers and to mandate the vaccine. And that is wrong. That is reprehensible. What we have seen here is a government that is abdicating its responsibility and failing the people of Grenada and also the employers of Grenada. If we look at Barbados, we have had policy statements issued by the government of Barbados, Mia Motley and her cabinet, Minister of Labor, Minister of Health, that has indicated that they will not tolerate any employer trying to enforce or to victimize a worker to take the COVID-19 vaccine. What we have not had here is a government who has spoken responsibly on the matter of vaccination when it comes to employer and employee. And that is wrong. And I'm urging the government to fix this. You do not have the, the scope when you speak in parliament as government, as prime minister, as minister, and you go out there on the street in a radio station, you are still the prime minister of this country. You are still the minister of health. You are still the authority that governs our country. And so therefore this big debate must be guided by some policy from you. It must be guided by reason, discourse and debate. Have a panel, have a conference, call employers together, call labor unions together, Call government together and let us sit down and discuss this thing. No legislation, passing things into law is not so simple. And I agree on that point. We agree. But we cannot have a government that just says to employers, if I were you, I would do the same thing. And I don't blame you for saying that is wrong. That is reprehensible. That is a government abdicating its responsibility to its people. And we want to urge from the, from the public workers union that government must do better. It is not acceptable. For you to for you, for you to be doing that and flip flopping like that, let us sit. Let us have this conversation. COVID is not going away any so, anytime soon, and you will have persons in our society who are going to say, for religious reasons, for personal reasons, for other reasons, I am not prepared to take a vaccine that's not yet been approved. And again, let us stick right here. I'm not the scientist. 
COVID-19 vaccines have emergency use authorization within a pandemic. It is different to a polio vaccine or an influenza vaccine or all these other childhood vaccines that we take routinely. I hear people making that argument, but I want to believe that when those vaccines came on stream long before all of us were born, the persons who were confronted with it, who had to deal with it as a, as a new population taking it, they would have asked the questions. And I believe it's acceptable for us to ask the questions. I believe pushback is acceptable. And I believe that there are acceptable ways to try to encourage employees to take the vaccine. I, I know you, you want to go to your break, um, 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 Blossom, but I want to refer as well to employment, discipline and termination of employment in our labor code. And it lays out to you the steps. So when you see an organization threatening to withhold an employee's NIS benefit payment and saying that even workers who work at home cannot work if they don't take the COVID-19 vaccine, you know, you're wondering, are they aware of our labor code and have they themselves weighed and, and, and balanced all the liabilities that they themselves as employers um, would have to face? But what we do know is that we would like our country to get back to normal. The vaccine seems to be the way to go. And so we have to respect persons' rights and we all have to be, be mindful of how this society. Um, I think they said the next batch of vaccine, vac the present batch of vaccines is going to expire in July. I'm not here to make a case for it, but I think that people ought to think earnestly about whether they would want to get vaccinated before those vaccines expire. The expired ones, they have gotten rid of it. They got a new vac uh, batch a few weeks ago, so uh, um, those should be able to last a few months. So it's not expired. Well, no, July. some went to Trinidad, and just last week, I think government ministers sent around something saying that there is a present batch that will expire in July, okay. the first week of July. But they also yes. have a fresh batch that has some yes, months they do. in it still. Yes, they do. Uh, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and continue speaking with PRO of the PW, Daisy Hazard. To the point, we'll be right back. It's time to line virtually one more time. Gemma Rayburn Baines here for Spice Island Cultural Festival, a celebration of Grenada, Caracou, and Pity Martini. This summer's festival is a celebration of life with food, fashion, music, and culture. Join us online Saturday, July 10th, 3 p.m. on Facebook and YouTube at Spice Island Cultural Festival. Info, SpiceIslandCulturalDay.com. Do you hear what I hear? Listen to the ocean and you will hear a cry for help. The ocean is hurting and we are the source of the hurt. But we can stop and start to heal our ocean by preventing pollution from getting into our waterways. It can start with you. Join an active organization or better yet, make a personal commitment. Commit not for just one day in the year, but for the rest of your life. Let's dispose of our plastic and other waste responsibly. And let's start building resilience. Let the healing begin. This message is brought to you by the OECS Commission with funding from the government of Norway. Remlet, tackling ocean pollution from turf to surf. Can you spend wisely and have more savings? Yes, you can. Learn more with Money Matters on GBN Television. The Money Matters series explores 12 top ways to save money. In this series, you would learn how to save by setting up your spending money right. Save on vehicle loans, home improvement projects, your credit cards, and even on prescription drugs. Tune in every Tuesday morning at 7.15 for Money Matters, a lighthearted conversation with financial planner Tali Francis. Follow the rebroadcast on Thursdays at 6.50 p.m. and on Sundays at 7.30 p.m. Money Matters is a financial literacy public awareness program sponsored by Republic Bank Grenada. Republic Bank, we're the one for you.
come back to to the point speaking with public relations officer of the public workers union daisy hazard this is a point in the program where we're going to open the phone lines the phones have been ringing since the program started actually the landline number 435-2041 the whatsapp number is also 435-2041 please only written messages on whatsapp and you can continue posting your comments questions queries concerns on facebook and youtube call us if you can please keep the questions to one minute or less so we can facilitate as many as we can let's go to the first caller good morning caller hello good morning morning yes how are you doing i'm good yes i just want to say that um the main main obstacle in the way that i believe that the government you know you know has this problem in collection of revenue you don't fall in the economy is because of COVID-19. Because it wasn't COVID-19. Everybody going to be happy. But I'm very happy the level of maturity for the Labor Commissioner, the Minister of Labor, and all of you who are sitting on the table, negotiation table, I, I want to encourage you all to do it in good faith and understanding and take mindful of what is taking place in the Caribbean. Look, Trinidad, look, St. Kitts, look, St. Vincent. And even we have some illegal people coming in, you know, we don't know, we don't know. So I believe the the best opportunity for us, and I believe you should encourage your your fellow people to to take the vaccine. So I Thank wish, you. and I wish everything goes speedy in good faith and come to some resolution and stop the blame game on other persons. Thank you very much. Ms. Hazard? Well, I do want to say um, thank you, Paula, for your kind comments. Um, I do like your tone, and thank you as well for liking the way that both sides have represented the issue. And I am also very happy that you would have urged the government to try to settle this thing, because blaming and shaming certainly doesn't move our country forward. One, on a point of correction, um, yes, we've had, we know that because of COVID, revenue have fallen. But if we look at the statistics, and those are public, um, we would have seen that as from February, revenue streams have, have, have been lifting and has almost come back to normal. Um, government has misrepresented those facts and figures in the public. And I say so because this is factual. So it's not back up to 100%, but it's almost there. And um, I want to say here, because about three weeks ago, I spoke about our revenue collection and the fact that revenues were up because we know the and the union knows it's up because our workers are the ones collecting the revenue. And many of the officers at the Ministry of Finance, the Inland Revenue Department, came under fire from the chicken hawk. There is a chicken hawk consultant that circles that, 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 that workplace and really, really intimidates workers. And we, we heard that that goodly lady um, was in full force you know, I'm reprimanding our workers. But this is public information, and it should be public information. The statistics, the revenue of our country doesn't belong. It's not the purview of the government. It belongs to the taxpayers, the people of uh, uh, the, the people of Grenada. And yes, and we know that last year revenues fell, but they've been rebounding and bounding back very nicely. So just wanted to make that correction. And wanted to say, please, do not further victimize our workers. Do not circle and go after our workers at the Ministry of Finance Department because the PRO is saying this here today. It is public knowledge. And if our workers share that information with us, they have every right to do so because it's not the purview of the government of Grenada. We are, all of us, every single one of the 110,000 of us here comprise the government of Grenada. Our statistics, our revenue collection is everybody's business, not just for 14. And the chicken hawks that they employ to intimidate workers. Um, a question on Facebook. Uh, okay, let me get down to the question. Hold on, hold on. Uh, we all know when the Prime Minister made an announcement of giving the 4%, told us that election is closely approaching. The night before the past election, the unions went in bed with government and ended up with a slap in the face. Why we're here now again with the same government. Can you tell us what different steps the unions are taking to make sure that they're not falling back in the very same trap and will the deducted salaries be part of the negotiation as a strong viewpoint meaning deal or no deal um that's a very logical and reasonable question and i want to thank the caller for asking it now to say that the unions went into bed with the government that is not exactly an, an apt description 
Because as labor movements, we do have, and we should sit with um, parties, be it NNP, NDC, any party, um, to hear from them what their plans are for labor. Because what a government does with its labor force, the policies that it enacts, the laws that it breaks and so, that has implications not just for workers, but for the entire country. And so whenever an election is, is near, we know that these political parties would go about and speak to different members of the society as to what their plans and intentions are. And the labor movement definitely should want to speak with them, all of them, to hear what they have to say. Now, in the last, I think that caller is referring to election 20, 2013, 20, help me with the numbers anyhow. That election when we would have signed an, an MOU regarding pension. And I'm glad that the, call, the, the, the question has gone there because we must, we cannot end this program this morning without speaking pension, about pension. And um, we thought that we were dealing with an honorable bunch of persons. The, the labor movement thought that we were dealing with a government who was in office, was serious about getting back into office and would make good on the, not just a promise, but a memorandum of understanding. This is an honorable agreement. And so there is no way. We also knew that this political party campaigned. It was one of the stronger points of their campaign that it's unconscionable that any person should serve their country for 20 and 30 years from their youth, work their fingers to the bone and have to be retired into poverty and without any money. This was said, it is incontrovertible. There are persons who would say, no, 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 the party never said that. The prime minister never said that. Yes, it was said, the videos are there. And we signed that MOU, unions debated with their members. I was not part of the executive at the time, but I sat here right at this union hall and I urged my executive to sign the MOU because we felt that if there was a memorandum of understanding, once the elections was over, any party that was forming the government would have to honor it. And what we saw is that when they came into office, they did not honor, not only did they not honor the agreement, but they went on to decry the unions and to decry the pensioners and to say that we don't deserve a pension, we're greedy and we're trying to run this country into bankruptcy. And that is shameful. And so unions haven't been caught out um, before. We know that we are not dealing with persons who are bent towards honor. We know that there's no honorable agreement that we can sign. And I'm talking about PWU and my own instinctive feeling here. And I'm certain that we would not be caught by election promises and gimmicks um, in the future. It is unfortunate that this is what parties had to resort to in order to gain the support of, of, of voters in this country. And then you turn around and you slap us. And yes, slap us. There are pensioners who have died with no pension. You know, there are persons who are now retired and they're struggling. But Blossom, I want us to delve into that a little bit um, deeper later. But thank you, caller, for that question. A WhatsApp uh, statement. Teachers have always negotiated a different package to public workers. If it was the same across the board, there would be no need for multiple unions. Let public officers sit at their desks and play stush while teachers pound the pavement and feel the 4% going to fall in their lap. Added to that, they ain't have the numbers to pose a real threat. Too much Iman is in the system to take up the slack. All right. So that person has um, brought it right home to me. And again, Carla, I want to um, I want to thank you for that comment. I have to make a correction. It seems that I've been saying that we're meeting with the Labour Commissioner tomorrow. We are not meeting with the Labour Commissioner. We are meeting with the Labour Minister, Honourable Peter David. So just to be very clear, we have met with the Labour Commissioner before. The matter was re um, referred by the Labour Commissioner to the Labour Minister. And we will meet with the Labour Minister tomorrow. Um, you know, the caller raised some, the, 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 the question raises some pertinent points of um, that I alluded to and spoke about before. The fact that public servants, the, the nefarious ways in which public servants have been employed really have left a lot of employees in fear, in fear of the employer, the government of Grenada. Let us stick that point there, that we have thousands of Grenadians who are employed and they are in fear. They go to work every day in fear of the employer, the government of Grenada. I want that point to stick and I want it to resonate. The person spoke about Imani workers and boss, give me a couple of minutes to speak about contract workers and yes, the poor Imani workers in our country. Now our labor code again also speaks about the way that persons can be employed. And I want to read here. 
Continuous employment and continuity of employment means an employee's period of uninterrupted employment with the same employer. Now we have persons who government has been employing for the last number of years in contractual positions. Those persons are doing the job of established workers. An established worker is a worker who is hired properly by the Public Service Commission Grenada. And there are many people who tell you all day, oh, well, the Public Service Commission is of no use, it's obsolete, it's, you know, it's old. But there is a reason why the PSC is enshrined into our constitution. The PSC is enshrined to protect against the very, to protect against the things that we see government doing right now, to protect against employees, uh, against a person's ability to treat an employee badly just because they can and to victimize and to discriminate and to push around employees and to, and, and to just hire them in ways that you wonder whether they are engaged in slavery or purposeful, meaningful legal employment in our country. That's the role of the PSC. Now, what we have seen in the last number of years through this administration in successive periods of government, they have eroded to a large extent the function of the PSC by em em employing Grenadians through ministries. And so somebody, there are many workers, hundreds of workers who are working every day, some with letters, some with no letters, but in most instances, letters whose expiry date has come and gone long ago. Just last week, we met with a bunch of workers at the hospital and you're asking, what's your last letter? And they're telling you 2003. Do the math. Isn't 2003 to now 16 years? They're telling you 2005. They're telling you, I have never had a letter to begin with. They're telling you, um, I don't have a letter, but they have asked me now to come in and sign a new one that, that asked me to give up all the years of service. Now, even if an employee does not have a letter which says that I, have, I, I, I am permanent, by the mere fact that you have been laboring with this government and with this country continuously, doing the same job, whether you are a maid, whether you are a cook, whether you are a groundsman, a driver, a nurse, but you have been doing this work continuously for more than two years. The labor laws of Grenada says you are deemed to be a permanent employee. And so all of these employees have grounds and case that they can take to the court before the labor minister, before the labor commissioner to say, I want to be made permanent. Now, when you come in and you say to them, forget about the work, the years that you worked before, that don't matter because you were not coming in to begin with. That is a lie because our, our labor laws says that they are permanent. Now, when you force these people to sign new contracts, what you are asking them to do is to give up all the years that they have served before and the hope, the faint hope that some politician, some member of parliament, some administration, some government will come along that has a conscience and we'll say, we cannot do that to our own Grenadian people, our own Grenadian brothers and sisters. We cannot employ them for all these years. And later when they are going home, they go home with nothing. Or they get a little extra share payment of $300 after having cleaned the hospital floors for 18 years. We cannot do that. And perhaps they are going to remedy that situation. You're asking them to give up all of that. So we've come across a bunch of workers who are being asked to sign new contracts, give up 10 years of employment, 12 years in the same position. You're now being asked to sign contracts where when you want vacation, you have to take no pay leave. I want to say to the public again so that the public understands. We have a government. We have administration. To give up all the years of employment and sign new contractual arrangements. But when they finish working at the end of a year and they need to take a rest, which international labor laws speak about, the ILO, International Labor Organization, tells you that a worker must be afforded one, sick days per year, and two, holiday days per year. And you have this administration asking persons to sign contracts where when they want vacation days, they must take no pay leave. I mean, that is sickening. It, 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 it blows the mind that in all Grenada right here, there are people who would sit down and conjure up these ways of employing Grenadian people and disenfranchising them. Sometimes when the unions speak about it, people get a bit upset. We're not making these things up. 
Let me talk about a sister at the hospital who worked eight years as, a, as an Imani. And I heard again on the street this weekend, the administration speaking about Imani workers. And you hear government ministers crying that they don't understand what has happened with this program. And they didn't know that there are workers working eight and nine and, and how many years as Imani. And all these years, it's been one salary. They've not received an increase. And they don't know. How could you not know? You do know. When you visit our ministries and you have meetings with us, we tell you. You cannot say that you do not know. You are aware. You are the ones who have created the unconscionable conscionable methods and manner in which these persons are engaged and are employed. It is your hatchet job. You have created this monster. You cannot be telling Grenadian people now that you don't know. How could you not know what you are the authors of? How could you not know what you are the architects of? How could you not know when these young people, but well, they're not so young anymore. We have Imani persons who are 40 years and more, and they tell you I came in as an Imani. So you have this one lady who worked eight years as, as an Imani. And she went to take up another job within government, within the same department, because it offered her, I think, probably $100 more. And she was told, well, all the, the bother about them is that gone down the drain. I mean, think about it. You just tell a worker that, that that goes down the drain. Don't bother about those eight years that you've served. You just start to work. This is a woman in her 40s with grandchildren who has been serving this country on her feet all these years. And now you're telling her that because during the pandemic, there were times when her children, and she has four of them, were not at school because the Ministry of Education did not have schools open. And she was forced at times to remain home with these children. You have persons who are threatening her and saying to her, do not come back here another day and say you can't come to work because you're going to lose your job. She has reported to the union that she has to do a medical procedure. And she's being told as well, you're not eligible for sick leave because you just start to work. This is what our government has created. This is what this administration has created. This is what is happening to people, hundreds and thousands of young Grenadian persons every day in this, in this society. It is sickening. It is a shame. And the government cannot say, well, I'm going to take responsibility because I'm the government. No, you are the authors and finishers of it. You have created those conditions. You are aware of it. And rather than really fixing it, what you are doing now is taking these same Imani workers and, and contract workers and changing. You're asking them to work as if they're independent contractors. So a young Grenadian person who's doing the job of a clock typist every day has to assign a contract as if she's an independent contractor. And I want to say to persons, when these young persons sign these contracts as independent contractors, government does not even make the NIS payments. So we have an NIS organization that, that's telling us that they have to move the retirement age to 65 because the benefits are becoming less, not enough persons are paying into that pool, but you have the largest employer in this country, the government of Grenada, employing young people in this country and not paying NIS benefits for them. If they have to pay that money, they have to pay the full sum on their own, no part payment by government. And they have to make that choice and that determination to go into NIS and pay that money every month. The repercussions of that blossom is enormous for this society because what we are, what we are learning here is that we have persons who are working on contract with government. They are fearful of, of, of calling in for a sick day. They are, they, if they send in a sick leave, they receive no pay if they do not pay NIS on their own. Um, they are being told as well that if they take vacation leave, they have to take it as no pay leave. And yet nobody's paying an NIS for them. When these persons become older, and they have, they have not been paying into NIS. What protects them? Where are the caveats? What, what is going to become of them? And even when they fall sick, even now, what's going to become of these young people? And it's not one or two, it's hundreds. Government, you need to do better. You cannot be doing this to the nationals of this country. It is unconscionable. It is wrong according to our labor code. We urge you to do better. Daisy, that was a, a, a very profound um, plea. I'm um, sharing your concerns on Imani. Um, unfortunately, we need to end here. I know you wanted to speak more about the pension issue, but of course, uh, you will be back in short order, I am certain, as we continue to uh, monitor and follow what's happening with the PWU, public officers, 4%, other issues. And we'll be back soon, and then we can get into the pension issue. Yes, thank you very much, Blossom. I believe that the pension issue needs an entire program of its own. And so we do look forward to engaging with GBN and with the public um, very, very soon. 
um, to discuss the matter of pension and gratuity. I do want to thank all our listeners across the diaspora, Grenada and Caracol and P.T. Martinic for joining with us this morning and um, supporting our cause as workers in this country. Thank you so much. Uh, before I let you go, there's the, uh, the, the comments on the social media, Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp. They have all come to the consensus, so I will just put it into one question. Do you have political aspirations? Uh, because of how eloquent you've been speaking this morning, many of them are saying you should join this party and Grenada needs a female prime minister. I nominate Ms. Hazard. Do you have political aspirations? And um, I just want to say to the public that I do not take your vote of confidence lightly. I want to thank you for your words of encouragement. Um, it really certainly boils me up. It boils up our union. So thank you very much. Um, and at this time, you know, it's, it's all in God's hands. I certainly have no aspirations to be a politician. I believe that we can do a lot of good outside of the political sphere. I also believe that sometimes when people get into politics, somehow they seem to lose their way. And so for now... I am doing my part. I can do a bit more. Thank you for your vote of confidence. Lovely. Thank you very much, Ms. Hazard. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you. All right. Public Relations Officer of the Public Workers Union, Daisy Hazard, our guest this morning. We thank her so very much. Always eloquent. Um, always exciting to listen to her. And thank you, viewers and listeners, for tuning in to To The Point. I know President of the Union, Brian Grimes, was on the Facebook. Um, so good morning to you, Mr. Grimes. That's the end of the program, end of my time today. I'll be back tomorrow morning, God willing. Joseph is up next with Mid Morning Buzz, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.